Okay, let's get started. So Amorph Circle of the Dark Mother, we um, are a group um, physically located in Columbus, Ohio. Um, we do have people all over the world that are part of our group. Um, our focus is Gnostic Kabbalah, uh, which we'll talk a little more about Kabbalah as we go through this. Uh, Gnosticism is, of course, um, if, if you've heard of it, is, of course, experiential knowledge. So we do um, sort of a pagan um, version of Kabbalah. We do incorporate some of the Jewish tradition. We do incorporate a lot of ritual magic and other things. So it's a little hodgepodge of whatever works pretty much. I also always want to say that we have a particular way of doing things, partly because that's the way we learned where we found it works for us. That does not mean that everything we say do we believe is the only way, nor do we think that if somebody has a working way of doing things, that they should give that up and do what we say. Um, everything we do, you can incorporate or not if it doesn't work for you. Um, so either take it as knowledge or take it as something you might want to try. But either way, um, totally respect whatever your beliefs and your way of doing things are. So today we're going to talk about Tree of Life or Tree of Shadows, or both. Um, and the reason for this is I, I we do work with both, and I get a lot of people on either side of this question um, saying, well, how come you, you know, work with Tree of Shadows, and how do you work with Tree of Life too, or vice versa? So we'll get into that, and I'll explain a little bit if you don't know Kabbalah or don't know much about the Tree of Life or Tree of Shadows, we'll talk about that. So first, what is Kabbalah? So Kabbalah is best known in Jewish tradition and is often used by many ritual magic traditions, such as Golden Dawn and Thelema. It's also used um, in different ways in a lot of different traditions. The left-hand path tends to use Kabbalah, but from the Tree of Shadows perspective. Um, and then there's other traditions that pretty much do it from the Tree of Life um, standpoint. Um, some do um, work with, with a little bit of both, um, as, as we do, and we'll get into that. Um, so you know, you probably know that Madonna sort of brought Kabbalah to the public eye uh, because she was working with it from a Jewish perspective. Um, Again, not a problem with that. That's just one way of working with it. However, the word Kabbalah really means tradition or giving. Once you understand Kabbalistic teachings, it can be used really as a, as a filing system or a system of uh, being able to compartmentalize things, a way to look at uh, deity, the universe, consciousness, yourself, um, pretty much anything. And it's super flexible. And what that means is no matter what tradition you work in, you can apply it to your practice. And what I mean by that is, let's say you don't believe in deities. Well, you can use the tree as consciousness, different consciousness of you, if you believe at the universe, if you do work with deities, you can put any paradigm on here. Um, in fact, I have used the Greek, uh, Greco-Roman tradition to show people how easy it is to apply the different paradigms as, as you learn more about Kabbalah. Um, so, so you can literally put anything on it, bright, dark, whatever. Um, this class is, or this course or this talk or whatever is not a course on Kabbalah. We're not gonna go into every detail of it. Um, I do have a Kabbalah class on video here on, on, um, well, on YouTube, and we have documents on our website also. Um, so if you go look for Mark H. Williams on YouTube, you will find um, the Circle of the Dark Mother um, information and our YouTube channel. And then our website, which I will type in here. Um, Circulus Matrum means um, Circle Mother. Um, it's really Circle of the Dark Mother, but that's really long for a URL. So we limited it to, to that shorter um, amount. So let's let's get in to this and we can talk about the next pieces. So one question is, you probably have seen Kabbalah spelled with a K, a Q, or a C. And the reason for that is none of these are wrong. Uh, but the reason there's the different spellings is Hebrew has its own alphabet. So when a Hebrew word is transliterated into English and we change it to our alphabet, 
there's several ways it can be spelled. Um, can anybody else here except for Amber? Your voice seems a little choppy. Okay, I'll try to get closer. Amber, well, let me type so she, she can't hear. I don't see her connected. Okay, um, hopefully I'll get closer to the mic and hopefully that'll help. Is this helping? I'll take it as a yes. So as I said, Hebrew has its own alphabet. So when a Hebrew word is transliterated to English, there's several ways it can be spelled. And the reason is, is the first letter of Kabbalah is Kaf. And of course, that's in a Hebrew letter, but that can sound like a K, a Q, or a C. So it's really up to the person translating how they transliterate. Kabbalah with a K is usually used by Jewish and mystical Kabbalah practitioners. Kabbalah with a Q is usually used by ritual magic, Golden Dawn, Hermeticism, and the left-hand path. And then Kabbalah with a C is usually used by Christian forms of the tradition. Now, that doesn't mean that that's always the case. For instance, I learned this from a Jewish Gnostic and mystical perspective, but I really work more in a a mixed path with ritual magic. So I really could use a Q, but I use K because that's how I've learned it. Um, I, in fact, in, in writing, have tried to switch to Q and I just can't do it because I've used the K for 20 years. So whichever one of these spellings works for you is totally fine. So first, the tree of life. So this is the, what would one would call the right-hand path. This is the more traditional tree. This is a glyph used in modern Kabbalah, and it represents everything we talked about. It's divine light moving through various dimensions that lead to creation. And these are God, creation, us, everything. And you can apply, um, you know, whatever really to, to this that you want. You don't have to stick to uh, Judaism. Um, you don't have to stick, whoops, sorry, I was trying to type. Um, you don't have to stick to really anything. You can put anything on here you want. And we'll talk a little more about these, these spheres and these paths. Um, in this glyph, there are 22 Hebrew letters, which are the paths, and there are 10 spheres. Although there is an 11th sphere, which is located sort of over where the number two is. That is not a separate. It is not a sphere of light. It's actually a dimensional gateway. Um, so there's 11, but really there's 10 sephira or sephira in, in plural. The netava or netavit are the 22 Hebrew letters, and they represent consciousness as it moves between the spheres. So this glyph is the tree of shadows. This is the tree of the tree of shadows, which is used by the left hand path to represent the emanations of darkness that represent what they call what's called in Hebrew sitrahara, the other side. This tree con consists of ten spheres as well, but they're called klifa or klifath, and there are still twenty two paths called netava or netavit, and these paths um, are on the tree of shadows, and they're sometimes called. Klepothic tunnels instead of net of it. It's just since some of these, some of the left hand traditions don't use Hebrew as much, um, instead of paths, they will call these Klepothic tunnels or the way to get between these spheres of darkness. Klephoth in Hebrew means husks of darkness, where the sephirot are spheres of light, the Klephoth are spheres of darkness. And you'll see that the names in English, which on the other tree we had is the only name on there, but the, the names here you can tell are sort of dark. I mean, we have things like Queen of Night, the Obscene Ones, the Poison of God, and so on. Um, and we'll talk more about that um, as we go. But this is definitely the darker tree 
and again, what's used with the Tree of Shadows. Um, this also has another sphere, not a cliff off, but a tunnel between um, universes that sits just below number two and three, just like in the other tree. And it has the same name in both trees, in fact, which we'll talk about in an upcoming slide. So aspects of the Tree of Life. So as I said, there are 10 sephirot and then one non sephirot sphere. So if we go from the bottom or the top down, we start with Keter, which is the Hebrew wor word for crown, Hokma, wisdom, Bina, understanding, and so on. So the, the name in Hebrew means the same thing it's written in English. So you don't have to memorize the Hebrew names. Um, it took me a long time to do that because I'm not a great linguist. Now it's natural for me to use the Hebrew. Um, but if you do look it up in any kind of Kabbalistic book, you're probably going to see the Hebrew words. So that's why I always include them so that people aren't um, confused what they're looking at. And then each one of these has a name of God in Hebrew. And they mean different things, and they're all different personalities of God. So the first one, Ahaya, is um, really thought of as God Most High. Yahweh is thought of as Father God. Elohim is Mother God. El just means God. Elohim Gavor is God in severity, and so on. Um, and then you get down to the last sphere, which is called Deat. And that is the non separate the one that's that's sort of below two and three on here, right in where the number two is in the past. Um, that is, as I said, a gateway to other dimensions. And you'll notice that the name here is Yahweh Elohim, which is the combination of the two spheres above it, with wisdom and understanding. Um, all of these also have an archangel associated with them. There's also orders of angels and their astronomic attributes, but we're not here to go through all of that. That could take a whole hour or two hours to go through all of it. But there are these different archangels and they all have different attributes as well. So the idea is each of these spheres has a personality of God and it has other attributes. Um, and when I say personality of God, you don't have to limit that, as I said, to Judeo-Christian. You could put, um, you know, for instance, at Yahweh for Hokma or wisdom. You could put Zeus if you're doing a, a Greek paradigm. Elohim could be Hera. Um, you know, you can go down through here and understand the, the energy of that sphere and put whatever deity or being you want. Um, and then the angels have the same thing. So Archangel Metatron is universal, big angel that covers everything. Um, and as you go down, you get to angels like um, Raphael, which is healing, Uriel, magic, Mikiel, which is um, protection, Gabriel or Gavriel, which is prophecy, and so on. Um, again, there is a video that talks about all of these and what they mean um, in our YouTube channel. And then there's a document that goes through all of this on our website. Whoops. I'm really clicking everywhere today. So this is the Tree of Shadows, as I said, and this also has Hebrew names, and then it has the meaning of that name, plus... Whoa. Okay, sorry about that. So each of these um, on the Tree of Shadows, as I said, it has a Hebrew name, a meaning for it, and then an entity. Um, and it depends on your, your really your um, paradigm, what you think these entities are. Um, you know, in the left-hand path, they consider them demons. In some of Kabbalah, some of these are actually angels, like um, um, yeah. Kam Kamaliel. Um, yeah, Abaddon or Abaddon is, a, is an angel. Um, so there's there's definitely other types of beings here. Um, and of course, you know, I work with Lilith primarily. So Lilith to me is actually um, really a lot of things. But to me, yes, she was considered um, a Sumerian goddess. She was considered the Adam's first wife in Judaism. She's considered a demon by some. And by others, she's an enlightened um, goddess type figure. So you can, you can look at these however you want, but these are definitely the darker aspects. 
You notice that these are 10 spheres again. These are the Klippoth. These are all, um, again, dark spheres. And then all of these entities have a darker aspect to them. At the end, we have Dayat again. Dayat on the Tree of Light is usually called um, knowledge. Um, and on the Tree of Shadows, it's called the Abyss. Now, it's the same thing. It's just, do you get enlightened knowledge? Or if you're not ready for it, do you fall through into a dark pit? Um, and don't worry, it's all metaphor. It's not saying you're going to like actually end up in a pit. Um, so let's let's go on and talk a little more. So pros and cons of the tree of life. So what I want to talk about is why would you study the tree of life? And then why would you study the tree of shadows? So in this case, um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the pros of the tree of life. And these are not all of them. These are just some of the things that um, I consider pros of it. So first of all, it's approved the approved way by traditional Kabbalists. So what that means is if you go to read a book on Kabbalah, you're going to find the Tree of Life. You probably will find very little on the Tree of Shadows unless it's a left-hand path book. Um, that being said, the Tree of Shadows is in some of the source works. For instance, the Zohar, which talks very heavily of the Tree of Life, really talks quite a bit about the Tree of Shadows without really pointing to the fact it's talking about the Tree of Shadows. But because, for instance, Lilith is a is a big part of it. There are also a lot of quotes where they mix the two. They'll talk about the bright tree and the dark tree at the same time. The bright tree is considered a slower path because it helps the initiate ease into change. Um, and we'll talk more about the dark tree, but it's really a faster path because it doesn't um, help you into change. It throws you into it. There are many books on the subject of the Tree of Life from many different ways of looking at it, including, you know, very old uh, Jewish texts. The lower spheres are what I call safe and have guardrails. And what that means is if you're not ready to go on and go to higher realms on the Tree of Life, there's guardians, there are um, places in consciousness that sort of stop you from going too fast. Um, you really have to um, breach certain beliefs and certain um, ways of thinking to be able to move through the tree easily. So this tree is a little harder to maneuver, not impossible. It's just a little slower and it sort of bumps you back down if you're if you're struggling. Um, the bright tree is mostly compassionate and leads toward a more positive outcome, meaning it's it's gonna do something for you that's very friendly, very, um, compassionate from for the idea of it would be like a teacher that helps you to learn, but does it in a way where you're not really called out or or um, forced to go beyond what you're ready for. So the cons are it can be slow to achieve goals. It can be frustrating when the initiate does not feel that they meet the high standards of the spheres, especially as you go up the spheres. Um, like for instance, you get to close to the top, you get to has said, which is mercy. Um, that is a very, very bright and daunting sphere. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm not saying you have to be perfect and fully enlightened to get there. But sometimes we feel like we don't fit. Um, so it, it can be frustrating as you're like, I'm having trouble relating as we get higher up. And then it may cause the initiative to bury their darkness. And what I mean about that is I came from a tradition that was based in the bright tree, didn't really look at the dark tree. And the problem is if you didn't, if you had things that within you that were more dark, like maybe you struggled with something or um, you struggled with self-doubt, you were encouraged to sort of see yourself in the bright tree and sort of, I mean, you were supposed to work through it, but there was a lot of just keep going and don't worry about it. Um, and that does work over time, but it can be frustrating. It can make you, especially if you're working with others, it can make you sort of be like, I don't want to share that I'm struggling. So let's talk about the pros and cons of the dark tree. So the pros and cons of the tree of shadows. So the pros are it's a much um, faster path to change. And that's because um, really it forces you to look at things pretty quickly. And if you don't want to get mired up in them, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you look at it and say, hmm, 
How do I get through um, my struggle over this? Um, how do I get myself to a place where I'm not feeling shame? How can I grow um, to the next level? It's also much easier to envision the consciousness of these fears because all of us have had them. You know, for instance, I'll, I'll use um, the first sphere, which is called Lilith. Um, the, the entity there is Naama, which I consider an aspect of Lilith. And it's called Queen of the Night. And really what that one is, is looking at the dark side of nature, the dark side of us, where we feel abandoned, we feel left alone, we feel like we're not good enough. Well, that's real easy to relate to sometimes. So what that sphere tries to help you do is, is understand you're not and get you moving through it. It is easier to get lost in your darkness too in this tree though. If you find one that you really revel in, you can get a little bit stuck for in the other way. And instead of feeling like you're not good enough, you can get sort of like, yeah, hell, I'm like this and, and I'm just going to go for it. And, and to a degree, that's not bad unless you're hurting yourself or others, of course. Um, but in the end, we want progress. We want to move and grow and, and accept ourselves and be who we truly are. Um, it, it's also can become a power trip on the dark tree. And what I mean by that is because you're really working with these darker things and you're finding yourself growing quickly, um, some people can get lost in this, you know, like, I got it down. <laughs> We're in the bright tree. It's a little harder to get there because uh, you don't feel like you're moving as quickly. So why would you work with both? And obviously we saw pros and cons. So one of the things is to balance those. Um, so. I use the tree of life to work with enlightenment, understand consciousness, and feel connected to the universe. I use the bright tree um, when I'm trying to connect to a bright deity. You know, for instance, if I'm trying to connect to some entity like an archangel, I'm going to use the tree of life. If I want to connect to a darker manifestation, I'm going to use the tree of shadows. Um, so I try to use the tree of life as my aspiration but I use the tree of shadows to do shadow work, find what needs uplifted and find integration. Um, because what happens a lot is I'll be moving up the tree of life. I'll be working on one of the spheres and I'll find myself feeling either stuck or I'll feel like I don't fit this or that's a great aspiration, but I'm not relating. So what I'll do is I'll look at the corresponding tree on the tree of shadows or the sphere on the tree of shadows and say, Okay, so the shadow side of this is whatever it is. What can I do? Look at the first sphere again. So the first sphere in the tree of life is kingdom. And it's all about the natural world in a beautiful, harmonious light. Um, there is a dark side, but you don't really focus on it there. And it's about us understanding that we are part of this divine family, whatever, however you define that that we are an enlightened being and part of this, this consciousness. Well, sometimes that's, you don't feel it, right? So I'll go to the tree of shadows and say, okay, tree of shadows, this one is the queen of night. It's about feeling disconnected and it's about feeling not good enough. And it's about feeling like I've been abandoned. Why do I feel that way? And so it'll be a play of looking both of those and trying to join them because I don't want to forget what it feels like to be abandoned because I want to have that compassion on others. Um, and that's a reality in this world of sometimes it does happen to us. But I also don't want to get stuck there and feel like I can't move forward and that I'm completely alone. So I'll look at both of them and weigh their pros and cons and try to find a balance that's inside of me. Because we're in this physical world that it really is a combination of the bright and the dark. We are in a place that is not one or the other. It's both. And I work from a dual, um, a non-dual perspective, which means I don't think everything is one way or the other. I believe it's a mix of the two. Now, if you work in a, in a dual way, you're either all about the light or all about the dark, that's okay too. It's just not the way I work. So I will work on one tree, go to the other, try to work on something. If I find one I'm incredibly stuck at, I will spend more time in the tree of shadows trying to understand it. Why do I feel this way? What's going on? How do I uplift this 
And how do I bring down the higher um, or the tree of life piece to bring it into a vibration that works? Um, and how can I relate both of these to people around me? How can I look at the, the, the dark side and the bright side and understand everybody's a mix and feel the empathy for them and understand where they're at? You can place any deity or deity or spirit at any level of either tree, as long as they, quote, fit, unquote, the energy of that sphere. Um, for instance, in my book, Embodying Lilith, and there is a video on our um, YouTube channel that's called um, Aspects of Lilith. And what it what I do in that is I take all of the different aspects of Lilith and I place her on every separate and every cliff off. So for instance, I put her on kingdom as sort of her brighter side in Nayama, sort of the, um, the, the goddess of the earth, um, the incarnate Lilith, who's about love and passion. Um, and we have to get rid of our ideas of, of Western right and wrong. And I don't mean about, you know, you obviously don't want to hurt people, but what I mean is the Western views of like sex is bad. Um, she is about sex. Then you look at her at the tree of shadows. Again, it's it's Lilith as Nayama, but this is her feeling abandoned. And um, you know, in in as as Adam's first wife being abandoned by both her husband and her deity parent. Um, so I balance those two also in the in this these aspects of Lilith. Now you could do this with any figure. I use Lilith because that's who I work with. And I use her bright and dark sides and believe that she transcends both. Um, so you can work with the tree of a life and the bright side with one set of deities or, or entities. You can work with the tree of shadows with a different set, or you can take one entity or deity and put them at every spot and, and then work with how does that balance out? Uh, for instance, you could use the Greek gods on all the tree of life and the tree of shadows and understand Zeus, father, creator, blah, 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 sometimes was not so great with women. Um, well, he was great with them, but maybe in a way that was uh, sort of a little bit, uh, um, you know, not really good for the women. So, you know, you can see the dark and bright sides to these entities. And I, I, I'm not putting down any entity for what they do. What I'm saying is you can see that they fit both sides. And that's where I say, so do we. I, so I use the tree of life to raise consciousness and focus on the specific spheres of the tree where I need to understand my own darkness of, of, and that of the world. So I go back and forth. And then the, if you get into the paths, you can look at, and I have this in my book, Embodying Lilith as well, the Hebrew letter and the major arcana all represent the 22 paths. So you can take the Hebrew letter the first path, which is the fool at the top, um, the fool in the major arcana, is a left, which is spirit. And anything you can find out about a left or the fool card is that first path. Then, if you go over to the tree of shadows and look at the cliponic tunnel or the net of it, of the, or path of the tree of shadows, you can take everything you know about a left and and the fool and look at it reversed. Look at its dark side. And so you can see these levels of consciousness that go between the spheres as well. I recommend people start with the spheres if they haven't had much experience. Um, but once you do, you'll want to get into the paths as well. And I really believe the thing to do is if you're already in a tradition, you're working with one or the other and don't want to do the other, then don't work with the tree of life or work with the tree of shadows and don't feel like you um, have to go work with the other one. If you have an interest though, what I would do is I would I would start with the first sphere of both. So work with kingdom um, and Lilith and look at the pros and cons. Look at how it makes you feel, meditate about them and see what draws you um, and keep an open mind. So if one draws you, but you really feel like you know, you're being drawn, but later on you think, well, I wanna know what the other side of that is. Don't hesitate to go look and you can get as, deep into one side or the other as you want. You don't have to, um, you know, go full on with both sides um, or either for that matter. So I'm gonna use an example here. So in this example, 
we have um, understanding, um, which is the first sphere on the left hand side of the tree of life. It's the topmost of that of that piece, and it means understanding. And then on the tree of shadows, the same sphere or the same place is Sadriel, the concealers. So I place Lilith at this sphere for both. Um, and this is Lilith as the dark mother. And also, if you know anything about Lilith lore, this is Lilith the elder. There is a Lilith the younger, which I pl place lower on the tree, but this is Lilith the elder. On the tree of, the, of life, she's the mother who is enlightened and understanding. She's the first wife of Adam and eventually the sometimes consort of Yahweh in, in Jewish Kabbalah. And she urges us to transformation and evolution. So she is what pushes us, in my view, in this piece, in this sphere, she is what pushes us to become more, pushes us to learn about ourselves and transform into who we really are. She, from my experience, she is the consciousness that wants us to be as much us as we can be, balancing ourselves and becoming you know, happy and enlightened and fulfilled. On the tree of shadows, um, she's the demoness who's angry and protective. She is the wife of Samael, which is the poison of God. He's also the antidote to that poison, by the way, in Kabbalah. Um, she's the mother of demons, but she urges me to strengthen individuality. Um, I don't consider her evil on either in either case, but I consider her on the tree of shadows to be this force that says, stick up for yourself, be who you are, even if society doesn't like it. And in in they're both sort of mirror images of the same force, the same consciousness. One is more though about inner work and the other one is more about how to relate to what's around you. So, so that's how I do it. Um, and I think both of these are helpful as long as I don't get stuck on one side or the other. And what I mean by that, if I'm seeking transformation and evolution at the sake of everyone around me, um, or seeking that to my own detriment, where I'm letting myself be bullied or, um, or um, you know, put down because I don't want to be mean, um, then that's not good for my transformation. On the other hand, if that strength and individuality becomes where I'm bullying others or or hurting others, well, that's not good for me or anybody else either. So I need to find, again, I always think I need the balance and that's how it works for me. So I think that is the end of the actual slides, it is. So let me take us back to just the meeting and I'm going to um, stop the recording. So if anybody doesn't feel comfortable talking, uh, they 